Good morning. Uh, welcome to this special quarantine edition, if you will, of our Revelation class. A little bit about what happened. Uh, we were, Joyce and I, were exposed uh, to someone with COVID on Monday afternoon, which is a good thing if you were here in church last Sunday. Uh, no worries. It was on Monday. So we decided we should uh, quarantine here at the house until early part, maybe Monday or Tuesday, early part of next week, then we will get a, a COVID test. And if it's negative, we'll get back out in the real world. Um, we're not sick. Uh, we just want to be very, very cautious. You know, as a church family, we've made it this far without any person uh, catching the virus at any church service, which uh, I'm just really thankful to God, and I want to keep that streak alive. <laughs> we're getting so close to the end, and so uh, we're going to have this Revelation class via video today. I'm going to um, kind of rehearse last week's lesson a little bit, or review, I should say, and then we'll continue on. So I want to I want to go back to uh, chapter 14 and 15 we'll review and let's see we will uh, then move into uh, chapter 16 and we got up to uh, chapter 16 verse 16 so I want to review and then we'll keep moving ahead so let's open with prayer Father God thank you for this opportunity to share with our Revelation class, even though I'm not here in person, Lord, giving me an opportunity to teach your word. Lord, I pray that we will be able to retain, even though this isn't live, and uh, Lord, just give us your clear understanding of this difficult book in Jesus' name, amen. So last week, uh, we looked at chapters 14 and 15. Some of the details, both in heaven and on earth, they were not very long chapters, if you were with us. Uh, we had uh, talked a little bit about, uh, in verse 1, the um, group of 144,000 that are seen now in heaven, uh, which this verse kind of fast forwards to uh, the return of Christ. And they're in their uh, triumphant glory uh, with the Lord in heaven. Then uh, we talked about in verses 6 and 7, God having an angel proclaim judgment. <coughs> that, <clears throat> that's not COVID, sorry. And the opportunity, hopefully not, <laughs> the opportunity to receive the gospel. So kind of a unique way uh, to present the gospel by an angel rather than humans sharing to others. I think part of that is just a, a final opportunity to receive Christ. Also in verse 8, uh, there's a discussion there about Babylon or a statement. We talked about uh, the options that it's a literal city. Sometimes it's viewed as a religious a system sometimes is a political system. When we talk about a literal city, it could be connected with Rome. Many people believe that. Uh, and some, many believe that it is a rebuilt Babylon actually in Iraq. So we're not entirely sure uh, what the reference is here to Babylon. In verses 9 through 11 of chapter 14, a third angel there in that chapter uh, pronounces judgment on those who worship the beast. And there's going to be uh, a great judgment poured out upon them. 
looking at verse 20, the wine press was trodden outside the city. If you recall, we identified that city as Jerusalem, and blood flowed from the wine press as high as a horse's bridle, so four feet high, and 16, for 1,600 stadia, uh, which would be about 180 miles. This is a picture of what is commonly called the Battle of Armageddon. There's a, just a great battle with much bloodshed as nations come down in war against each other and Christ returns during that battle and destroys all the enemies. Looking into chapter 15, uh, we, uh, we saw the uh, verse 1, Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and amazing, seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last, for with them the wrath of God is finished. So these angels come out of heaven with these large bowls that they're going to pour out on the rebellious world leading up to the return of Christ. So these are the final, the final um, judgments. If you recall, there are seven sealed judgments. The seventh judgment contains the seven trumpet judgments, and the seventh trumpet judgment contains the seven bowl judgment. In verse 2, we have the first bowl of chapter 16, the first bowl judgment of painful sores. Interesting, it was though on those who bore the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. It could be that something there in those marks on the right hand or the forehead uh, causes some kind of infection. In fact, the word there is ulcers. Verse 3, the second bold judgment, the sea becomes like the blood of a corpse. R reminds us of the plague on the Egyptians. Um, so a similar judgment there. A third bowl in verses 4 through 7, the rivers now, fresh water, is also contaminated and either turns to blood or has an appearance of blood. The fourth bowl is that the sun... Uh, now scorches the people with fire. So don't know if there's a greater hole in the ozone layer and, and the sun now is, is, is just really scorching at a maximum degree uh, or this is just simply the judgment of God. Verse 10 and 11, the fifth plague the kingdom of the Antichrist, the beast, is plunged into darkness, so some kind of eclipse. Um, however, it seems to increase also the people's pain and sores, but still they do not repent of their deeds. The sixth bowl, the river Euphrates that runs through the Fertile Crescent in the Middle East is dried up and this makes way for the kings of the East, the Asian uh, powers to uh, come to the Middle East for this uh, final battle of Armageddon that we read just briefly about in verses 15 and 16. All right, this leads us up to our study now today. Revelation chapter 16, verses 17 and following. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, Peals of thunder and a great earthquake such as there had never been since man was on the earth. So great was that earthquake. The great city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And God remembered Babylon the great to make her drain the cup of the wine of the fury of his wrath. And every island fled away, and no mountains were to be found. And great hailstones, about 100 pounds each, fell from heaven on people. And they cursed God for the plague of the hail, because the plague was so 
severe. So this is the seventh and last bold judgment. Some people believe that the great city here in verse 19 is Babylon. Others believe it is Rome in Italy as spiritual Babylon. Still others believe this re refers to Jerusalem. If you look at this and you compare it to chapter 11 verse 8, the great city is identified as Jerusalem. And Zechariah 14.4 talks about uh, uh, changes topographically in Jerusalem at the return of Christ. So this may be a reference to this. Now other views of chapter 16, let me share with you the historicist view. Verse 3, the blood in the ocean to the historicist, many of them would say this represents the Roman Catholic's naval force being destroyed. Uh, in verse 4, the rivers turning to blood is symbolic of the invasion of Attila and the Huns in the 5th century against Rome. Verse 8 and 9, the scorching sun is a reference to the diminishing power of the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, during the French Revolution of the 18th century. Also verse 10, the darkness is the Roman Catholic Church's influence over people that results in confusion and disorder, a, a darkness of confusion. Verse 12, the Euphrates drying up, drying up is symbolic of the power of the Turks. So you can see, as we've been talking about during this course, that the historicist view is, uh, covers all the history of the church and has a lot of different uh, interpretations depending on the time period and the circumstances. For the preterist view that views all of Revelation fulfilled in the first century, the partial preterist view up to the fall of, of Rome, Verse 3, for the preterist, the blood um, is said there like a corpse or a dead man. Uh, let me quote from a preterist. The blood of the dead to the Jews would be the ultimate in uncleanness. So the image may simply mean that the whole of Judea has become covered with uncleanness and even has become like the sea, which is usually a symbol of the Gentile nations. Again, a reference to the bloodshed during the Jewish wars in which they were defeated and scattered by the Romans. In verse 4, the rivers turning to blood, the preterists would say this refers to the water in Jerusalem being contaminated during the Roman siege. In verse 10, the throne of the beast is Rome, and the darkness is the crisis of Emperor Nero, who committed suicide in AD 68, leaving a power vacuum. Um, that almost tore the Roman Empire apart. So those are a little bit of uh, uh, ideas and thoughts about some preterists. The spiritual view that it's this, this metaphorical prophecy about the struggle between um, good and evil, the also called the idealist view. In verse 3, shipwrecks, sea battles, tsunamis, and other sea disasters serve as bold judgments that bring judgment on evil people. Verse 5, the rivers becoming blood indicate God's judgment of people by, by drowning throughout history. So they, they would say this is, this is evil people that have drowned over the centuries. Verse 12, the drying up of the Euphrates is symbolic of the march of ungodly powers of the world against the church. So um, the the kings come to persecute the church uh, over the centuries. All right, those are some uh, other thoughts from other views. Let's move into Revelation chapter 17, verses 1 and 2. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, 
and he's talking to John here, this angel, come and I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality, and with the wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers on earth have become drunk. This prostitute, uh, seated on many waters, is a description of religious Babylon. This is the apostate church, the church during uh, the seven-year tribulation. The waters symbolize uh, all kinds of people groups, multitudes, nations, and languages. Uh, take a look at verse 15 on that. And so the angel's inviting John to see the judgment of the false church. Again, understand that at the beginning of the seven years, and no man knows the day or the hour, the rapture will occur. Believers will be caught up from the earth. And now you have a church that is not saved there will be people in churches during revelation there will be uh, pastors that and, and uh, priests that never truly receive Christ and they will join together in this one world church and so um, there is this uh, religion going on during the seven years verse 3 through 6 and he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast and was full of blasphemous names. And it had seven heads and ten horns. Do you call that beast? Let's continue. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her sexual immorality and on her forehead was written the name of mystery babylon the great mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations and i saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and blood of the martyrs of jesus when i saw her i marveled greatly so verse 3 john says in the spirit this is by a vision this is not in body and in verse 4, notice the purple, the scarlet, and gold, precious stones, and pearls. They can represent the false religions with all their trappings. You know, the fine robes, the gold, and the, the outfits, and the churches. All of this worldliness uh, in false religion. Verse 5, what is written on her forehead indicates that she represents false religions during the tribulation now let's think about the role of babylon in false religion if you go back to genesis chapter 10 uh, specifically verses 8 through 12 we learn of a man named nimrod so he's an ancient leader of babylon so we have now the rise of babylon and this Nimrod. Nimrod, the leader of Babylon, had a wife, and she is known as Semiramis. Semiramis. Semiramis, Nimrod's wife, started a secret religion of Babylon according to extra biblical history. When I say extra biblical, I mean not in the Bible. She started a secret religion, and according to a myth, Semiramis had a son named Tammuz. And it was, if you'll note here, by miraculous conception, what we're going to see is Satan's effort to um, confuse people about the true Messiah. And even before Jesus comes as the Son of God, there's this myth, this myth of confusion. So it's likely that this is a led. This legend was from a false fulfillment of the the uh, Messiah inspired by Satan. Tammuz, according to the myth, was killed by a wild animal and then came back to life. We see here a resurrection. And by the way, the worship of Baal, 
that you read about in the Old Testament was connected to the worship of Tammuz. So what we see is the, the uh, secret Babylonian religion kind of uh, migrates around the Middle East and into modern day Turkey uh, and Italy, uh, the Roman Empire, you see it continually kind of changing form, but it still has the, the roots of that ancient religion. When the Persians defeated Babylon in 539 BC, they outlawed, outlawed the mystery religions of Babylon. Therefore, what happened? The, the Babylonian priests, the secret priests and people, they moved to Pergamum, which, by the way, is one of the seven churches of Revelation. Pergamum, in modern-day Turkey today, was in Asia, Asia Minor during the time that John uh, wrote, or Jesus spoke to the Pergamum church. John wrote it down while he was there on the island of Patmos, which is just... Uh, three or four hours on, on the water off the coast where Pergamum is in Turkey. So later the teachers of the Babylonian mystery religions uh, moved from Pergamum to Rome. Now many church historians believe that these teachers negatively influenced the Roman Catholic Church and brought paganism into the church. And if you look at some of the traditions that are brought into the Roman Catholic Church, they certainly uh, mirror some of the influence and teachings of the Babylonian religion. The woman, symbolizing apostate religion, uh, will actually kill, put to death, true followers of Christ. So this is a one world church. It, it may be that all the religions come together. This whole concept that is becoming more and more popular uh, uh, as time has gone on, just a plurality of, of religious roads to God, whether you're a Buddhist or a Hindu or a Muslim, um, all of these religions together, a pseudo-Christian, and they all come together in a one-world religion that's symbolized by this, this woman who's riding uh, the beast. Verse 7 through 8, But the angel said to me, Why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast with seven heads and ten horns that carries her. And now... This angel is going to identify and explain the beast. The beast that you saw was, this is confusing, here it is. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to rise from the bottomless pit to go to destruction. And the dwellers on earth, whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, will marvel to see the beast, because it was, and is not, and is to come. Now these two verses have been the subject of a whole lot of debates. Verse 8, the confusion surrounds the beast being connected with Satan, the world dictator and his world government. The ten horns, we, we know about that, These this final alliance of governments into one overarching power. Now only Satan comes out of the abyss, but apparently he has authority and power over the world dictator and his government. Look at verse 9 to 11. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. Verse 10. There are also seven kings, five of whom have fallen. One is, the other has not yet come. And when he does come, he must remain only a little while. As for the beast that was and is not, it is an eighth, but it belongs to the seven, and it goes to destruction. Very complicated. What this appears to be is eight successive 
kingdoms. Now there's, we'll, we'll kind of touch on some other views, but if you look at this, um, you have these empires or kingdoms of history, beginning with Egypt and the pharaohs. And then Assyria, remember uh, the great power of Assyria that overthrew the northern kingdom of Israel in 722 BC. They were the world power at that time. And then the Babylonian Empire under King Nebuchadnezzar, uh, referenced back there to our study in Daniel. Um, he was uh, the world dictator during that time, followed by the Medo-Persian Empire, if you recall, the overthrow of Babylon in one night when the Medo-Persian army came underneath the walls as they dried up the canal, they diverted the Euphrates. Remember the handwriting on the wall on that last night, moving now into the Persian, Medo-Persian Empire. After that, a young man of great military intelligence by the name of Alexander the Great, the Greek Empire, uh, becomes the world power, followed by Rome. Now, many people believe where it states one is, and this is during the latter part of the first century, one is, would be the power of Rome through the Caesars. Now, this is, this is one view that has a lot of merit to it. So th this one is, one power, the Caesars, the second major empire is the, the, the final alliance, the revived Roman Empire, the Ten Kings. That would be the reference of not yet. So one is Rome under the authority of Caesar's first century and following then, and not yet the reestablishment of a Roman Empire with the Ten Kings. and than the final Gentile world kingdom of the Antichrist that over kind of uh, over arches or oversees uh, the kingdoms during that time. However, verse 9, some ancient writers identified the seven hills that rides on seven mountains as Rome. You may have heard the term about Rome, that it is the city of seven hills. And indeed, it is, it is um, a city on seven hills. But verse 10 identifies, or, or really speaks of the seven heads and seven hills, are identified as seven kings, not a city. So as I mentioned, there is this one interpretation that it is the eight successive kingdoms. John Wolver writes this. This view is also supported by verse 10. Five have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come. But when he does come, he must remain for a little while. John was writing from his point of view in which five prominent kings of the Roman Empire had already come and gone, and one of them on the throne, that would probably be Domitian, um, who was the one who persecuted the church and banished John on the island of Patmos. The identity of the seventh king, the one to come after John's time, is unknown. So that would be uh, the uh, Roman Empire. Verse 11, the eighth king represents the world dictator, often called the Antichrist. Now one possible explanation of the difference between the seventh and eighth beast is that the seventh beast is itself the Roman Empire revived at the end time. The revived Roman Empire and the eighth beast is its final ruler, the Antichrist. So there's a lot of views on this, as I mentioned here, is a very complicated passage. All right, verse 12 through 15. And the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour together with the beast. 
These are of one mind, and they hand over their power and authority to the beast. They will make war on the Lamb, and the Lamb will conquer them, for He is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those with Him are called and chosen and faithful. And the angel said to me, The waters that you saw where the prostitute is seated are peoples and multitudes and nations and language. That's the identification of the waters. It's this vast uh, false religion. Verse 12, uh, these uh, kings that are mentioned, they receive political power for only a short time, as in one hour. It's a very brief time in the tribulation. In verses 13 through 14, the war with the Lamb, that would be obviously Christ, is likely a reference to that last great battle uh, at Christ's coming, and that is the... Um, the Battle of Armageddon. I want, to, I want to go back to that because I think it's interesting. The Lamb will conquer them, for He is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And those with Him are called and chosen and faithful. Let's think about that group. They're called, they're chosen, and they're faithful that come with Him. Uh, where does the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the Lamb, come from? From heaven. Let's think about phase one and phase two of the return of Christ. In phase one, Christ comes for the church. That is what is commonly called the rapture, for the church. He, he um, raises the dead to be reunited with their spirits that are already in heaven, and that last generation meets the Lord in the air. So he comes for the church. Phase two is his return to earth, and he comes not for the church, because the church has been with him for seven years. The church comes with him back to earth. I think it's very likely the called and chosen and faithful here, my own thoughts, <laughs> uh, you can think through it yourself, but my thought is this is... A reference to the chosen ones you and I we Ephesians 1 makes it very clear in other passages as well that we are chosen of God we were called and chosen let's look at verses 16 through 18 as we kind of come down the home stretch here and the ten horns that you saw, they and the beast will hate the prostitute. So the political power and the Antichrist, the world leader, actually hates the prostitute. This false religion uh, who uh, they have appeared to be arm in arm with, they actually hate them. And they will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to carry out His purpose by being of one mind and handing over their royal power to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman that you saw is the great city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. So we see in verse 16, the beast, the world ruler, the ten horns, the ten kings, actually hate the prostitute and eventually destroy her. This seems to occur at the midpoint of the tribulation. You can read in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. You can also read Matthew 24, verse 15. So Daniel 9, 27, and Matthew 24, 15. Verse 17, God allows the beast to rule according to his sovereign plan. Just a lesson that God is in control of every event and every ruler, every person. He doesn't condone, neither does he force someone to do evil. He, it's by his permissive will. People who do evil are responsible for their own sin. God has no responsibility, but he allows it. Verse 18, the reference to the woman as a city is another link with ancient Babylon, this time regarded as a religious center for false religion. The apostate church, represented by the woman, was a combination of religious and political power. Verse 
verse 18 then introduces the next chapter, which seemed to refer to Babylon more as a literal city rather than a religious uh, church or entity. I hate to use the word church, but the false church. All right, I think that will wrap it up for today. Uh, I will uh, probably pick up the next week uh, with the other views of that chapter. We don't have enough time today. Uh, Brett will likely uh, review what we studied today, or I will, and then we'll uh, look at the historicist, preterist, and spiritual view, the idealist view. So let's close in prayer. Father God, uh, just thank you again that I can uh, be able to, I'm able to teach here through technology and uh, Lord, I look forward to getting back uh, in church, be preaching again next Sunday and, and uh, uh, being able to teach this class as well. Thank you for this church family, Lord. And as we have been so grateful throughout this course that you have not appointed us to suffer wrath, your final judgment. I truly believe we are the called, the chosen, and the faithful. We're not faithful by our own efforts, but you have kept us. First Peter 1, you have kept our salvation in heaven. And it, it cannot be snatched away. It can't be spoiled. It can't perish. And so, Lord, we are kept in your hand and Lord we look forward to the unfolding of your events as we go into the history the future history especially Lord whether we are dead or alive to be raptured up into your father's house for you've gone to prepare a place for us and you will come again and receive us unto yourself before that seven year tribulation and thus we will be forever with you. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.